Parker. Expected approach time 34, approach button 17. The altimeter 29 or 9 or 7. Welcome back to the channel everyone, this is Prickly Hedgehog, I hope this video finds you well wherever you're tuning in from today. It's time to have a little coffee here and sit down and mull over last week's smaller newsletter, late last week from Eagle Dynamics, which dropped rather quietly, something we've all been waiting on for many years, and that is multi-threading architecture is coming to DCS World sometime in 2023. The news, while not entirely unexpected, is something of a major bombshell for the future direction of DCS World and its playability for both complex mission and campaign sets, as well as multiplayer. So let's explore why and what all this means. We'll start with the blurb from Eagle Dynamics that explained the following. To date, DCS has performed most of the computational workload on a single thread. Some audio components were moved to a separate thread. This was not a problem in most cases because the graphics processor unit, or GPU, did most of the work and FPS was mostly limited by the performance of the GPU. As DCS has evolved, however, GPUs have become more powerful whilst the performance of a single CPU core remained practically unchanged. Instead, CPU manufacturers increased the number of cores rather than the clock speed of individual cores. As a consequence, DCS performance has become CPU limited. In parallel, DCS has also become much more complex with increased reliance on CPU calculations that has exacerbated the problem. To improve efficiency of CPU resource usage, ED have reworked the core of their engine. First, at the architectural level, it has been divided into two main threads graphical and logical. This opens up new possibilities for further thread parallelization of calculations in both the logical and graphical parts of the engine independently. Second, to meet the requirements of scalable multi-threading and the needs of modern graphics APIs, the graphical engine part has become significantly enhanced. In addition, many subsystems have been updated or written from scratch. Internal testing has begun and we plan to release the updated DCS graphics engine, also known as Edge, next year. The initial release of multi-threading support will contain a fully reworked engine including preparation of the graphical frame and the separation of the graphical and logical parts onto two independent threads. It should also be noted that the most significant performance improvements will be regarding larger missions. This will be a welcomed change especially in multiplayer, where unit numbers are typically far higher, and also, of course, VR performance, which will also see a significant performance improvement in large missions. Well, for most of us, this sounds perhaps like a simple frame rate boost, because suddenly DCS is now able to unlock more cores in order to boost the performance of modern computer hardware. And while that sounds logical, and indeed is basically accurate in layman's terms, and certainly how I understand computer functionality, I think it's worth unpacking a little bit more some of ED's explanation here. This indeed will be my plain summer's guide to how I think this works with regards to DCS World. I'm not a programmer or a hardware engineer, so these are my best educated guesses and assumptions, so bear with me. So let's dig back into this little history that ED was talking about with regards to CPU hardware. And they are indeed correct that CPU hardware basically remained relatively static for many years. Single core architecture was quite typical when the game first came out with CPU clock speed being the primary determiner of a PC's muscle. Essentially, you run the thing as fast as you can so that it can simply burn through mass quantities of data crunching like a nitrous oxide powered chainsaw. 
The problem was that chip manufacturers began to run into thermal walls running increasingly higher clock speeds, to the point that experiments in 8 GHz CPUs were conducted, which simply melted the CPU. There just isn't enough practical cooling, but it was an entertaining era for those experimenting with overclocking. You may have heard of experiments with, for example, liquid nitrogen, immersing computers in oil, and even liquid cooling. The latter now being the standard for modern CPU and GPU cooling these days, which was once the domain of hardcore overclocking gurus building Frankenstein gaming rigs trying to get the best out of their overclocked hardware. The solution to this problem for the thermal barrier was to increase the number of physical cores to the CPU and divvy up tasking to take advantage of spreading the load from the main core. This allows the CPU to run at comparatively lower clock rates since more hands or cores can be turned to a task or division of tasks, such as ED's description with the sound being moved to a different core. This sort of thing is known as asynchronous computing and is one of the keys to the success of DirectX12's architecture. We need to remember too that modern CPUs are not limited to their physical cores. There are of course roughly two logical cores per physical one, which provides even more computational resources for software to tap into. Thus my 16 core i9-11900 has effectively 32 cores, which the right programs can utilize to spread a task over many cores or divvy up multiple tasks, asynchronous computing again, to speed things up. As ED explained, the improvement in GPU performance has been massive, with beefy cards utilizing an enormous number of cores in order to render tons of data. We all know why data miners used GPUs and it's because of their potent calculation ability. As many of you know though, just throwing in a massive graphics card is not necessarily going to increase your frame rates in a game like DCS. If the CPU suffers from throttling across the lanes because of the limitations of DirectX 11, you're not going to get the full performance you are expecting. CPU bottlenecking is a thing. The game might look prettier, but something is going to suffer, and of course, usually it's the frame rates, and this is what ED was referring to with this, with this mismatch of hardware and the way their game interfaces with the API software to access the hardware in your rig. API is the software which allows your hardware to run a game regardless of what hardware is in the machine, such as NVIDIA or AMD-based machines, and now, of course, even Intel is dabbling the GPU market also. There's a complex symbiosis between the hardware, the operating system, and the API software that gets DCS running. Now, all the DirectX 9s and 11 games traditionally used only two to four cores. That is, until DirectX 12 came along, unlocking the access to all of these extra resources in the hardware, and therefore being able to run the much vaunted ray tracing lighting effects that we have seen over the last few years in some high-end games. Now DCS World uses DirectX 11 as far as I understand and the oft-mentioned Vulkan API that we hear about is effectively the replacement to OpenGL and provides for a non-Microsoft DirectX platform in which to get your game to work across multiple architectures as explained before and hopefully unlock the power of this magical multi-threading. It's a critical tasking interface telling the hardware what resources to use, when to end, and how to divvy up tasking priorities based on the operating system's programming as well. To do that properly, it appears that ED have been spending a lot of time rejigging their core engine software, and to quote, in some cases, subsystems have been rewritten from scratch. For those complaining about the length of time this is taking, it is not, I repeat, not an easy task. It is a tremendous amount of coding which requires painstaking work, attention to detail, and of course, subsequent testing to ensure it actually works as desired, and somebody else pointed out even rolling back to make sure that it can be undone and rolled forward again. Remember that one of the challenges for flight sims is the extremely complex physics which play a crucial role in the way aircraft handle and fly realistically based on geometry, weight, and all importantly, in jet fighters, centrifugal forces caused by extreme maneuvering. This, of course, does not even mention the weapons, atmospheric conditions like heat, wind, cold, and air pressure. 
It explains why, for a long while, we had quite simplistic physics modeling for AI aircraft, which could pull UFO-style boomerang moves, which would give Isaac Newton nightmares. The rationale for that was simplicity of the calculations for the AI was to reduce the CPU load on logical calculations where there were a lot of AI aircraft around. And a lot of people complained about this. Some of that has now been ironed out, but the problem still exists as described. So the crux of ED's intent here and all of this complex stuff, I think, can be summed up in the second to last paragraph. Multi-threading support will contain a fully reworked engine, including preparation of the graphical frame and the separation of the graphical and logical parts onto two independent threads. Essentially, what we're looking at here is that the CPU will be able to be used more to utilize the logical parts, that is the physics engine, I suspect, and then the GPU will able to focus on the graphical portions. Now, these two things aren't necessarily unlinked, but nonetheless, this is going to divvy up the resources that the game uses in a much more effective way. Hopefully, that means we should see less throttling issues where purer number crunching overlaps with graphical draw demands thanks to the asynchronous computing power options within multi-threading CPUs. This, I think, explains the last part of the briefing where the biggest improvements in game performance are where there are larger missions with a lot of assets or in multiplayer environments which can get choked with too many physical assets or other players. It also means, as described, improvements to VR users' experiences should improve where things are rendered twice for each eye's screen in order to get the depth of field. Those of us using flat screen monitors and a single rendering is occurring don't suffer that issue quite as much in this performance drain. It's interesting to note that there still are quite a lot of VR users out there. In a recent survey I did with about 500 or so respondents, more than 30% of you are using VR exclusively. Almost 50% are using Track IR or similar, and the remainder are using no head tracking systems at all. VR use is only going to increase as the technology continues to evolve. So this ED update to Edge could help that out and is a massive step in a new direction for the game. Just recently, I saw a video from Tricker in which he described using the new NOR engine that is being used in military simulations. And it was interesting to note that he pointed out that the game was using, or if you like, all the software was using, I suppose is a better term, a very high-end VR system mated to a 4090 graphics card. So this is beyond the reach of most ordinary users. So yes, the graphics look fantastic. The game looks amazing. Well, the sim, the sim looks amazing. But again, this is high-end stuff, very, very expensive and beyond the reach of most ordinary players. It is not a civilian piece of equipment for the general public at this time. It is uh, benchmarked, if you like, uh, and targeted towards military operators. Massive outlay of expenditure. Certainly it looks impressive, but there's no indication yet that this will ever transfer to a civilian product. Well, let's talk about the summation here and what all this means in an encapsulated way. I think, personally, that this announcement is potentially one of the biggest ones yet from Eagle Dynamics, with no disrespect to the tremendous efforts to visually improve the game over the last two years or so, from 2.5 to 2.7, and now we're in 2.8, probably heading quite likely to a 3.0 update sometime next year. Any tweaks, enhancements, and flat-out overhauls, as appears in this case, can only be beneficial for DCS lovers looking for better immersion in their combat flight experiences. We are at something of a crossroads, I think, for the game as it catapults its way into 2023 and massive improvements to the game's performance. I actually think it's impressive how much it has improved into 2.8 recently, despite the lack of multi-threading. And if they pull it off next year in terms of introducing that concept, we're in for one hell of a treat, I think. It's always fun to explore how new modules and interesting news comes to the game, but it's often overlooked how much behind the scenes work goes on, especially with grumpy assertions from some of you about why it's taking so long. And that work is extremely complex, remember. It's critical to DCS's functionality and long-term survival and what is starting to shape up as a competitive market, including, as mentioned before, the commercial product world for military flight simulation, which ED dabbles in. 
I've had the good fortune to discuss this anecdotally with some real pilots, and despite all its faults, DCS World is not unimpressive to professionals where it's becoming increasingly costly to run live training missions, and therefore artificial training like this, virtual training, is becoming more important. One thing that is becoming apparent to me is that as the game's player base grows, we are seeing bigger strides in ED's ability to make these kinds of changes. This is reflected in the growing number of third-party official products and producers willing to invest time and energy in the DCS World platform to sell their wares, something I can't even imagine would have happened four years ago. Further to that is the massive growth in periphery hardware like WinWing's MIP for the F-18, a dedicated panel for the Hornet, which again signals the number of players we now have able to support that kind of purchasing of hardware. It's very, very exciting. It's increasingly difficult, again, despite any failing, to dismiss DCS World as the go-to platform for realistic combat flight simulation. And I think that wraps it up. Let me know what you think of today's topic. I know I barely scratched the surface of it in terms of how multi-threading works. Again, I applied the best logic that I could do to it. For those of you like me who have an interest in how it may change the game's future in broadly uh, simplistic terms, but don't have the computer science degree out there to fully explain how all of this works. Let me know if you think I got it right. I think that'll do for this episode. Please like, subscribe, share. If you enjoyed today's video, let me know in the comments section below your thoughts on the future of multi-threading in DCS world. And if you'd like to support the channel more, there is the super thanks button as well, which helps the channel chug along. I really want to thank everybody for their support. Thus far, we are close to cracking 10,000 subscribers. We've gone beyond uh, the 9,000 barrier, which was nice. And of course, we have had a little bit of extra support from ED. As you probably are aware, I'm now uh, an official content creator, if you like, or a sanctioned content creator. I suppose that's the better term uh, with ED. And I appreciate that support from them. This will do. Enjoy some of the amazing cloud features we experienced in yesterday's training session with the Air Warfare Group. 2.8 really is just fantastic. So we'll see you next time on the DCS sit rep. Cheers. Thank you.